Welcome to the Metaverse Podcast, Episode 2. My name is Noah Kravitz. Coming up on the show, a conversation with Jacob Steves and Ala Shabana from BitTensor. BitTensor is creating an open, decentralized peer-to-peer network that functions as a market system for the development of artificial intelligence. That's a mouthful, uh, but they're all really meaningful words. There's a lot packed in there. Jake and Ala do a great job of explaining what they're doing, why they're doing it, what it's all about, all the technical details. But in essence, what they're doing is they're building an online community, a network for engineers, people creating machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, to come together for a few purposes. One is to increase the efficiencies in the way that AI is created these days. Jake and Ala identified a problem with uh, just inefficiencies in the way that artificial intelligence is created, the way that advances are shared and built upon by the community. They think they have a better solution in BitTensor, so we get into that. And then the other thing is something that gets into the concept of a DAO, D-A-O, or Decentralized Autonomous Organization. This essentially is a structure for building a community online uh, that has ownership and governance baked right into the structure, So you can use a DAO theoretically to build anything from a social club to um, a company with a sort of alternative form of governance to actually, in theory, a government itself. There's a whole lot uh, in all of that. Jake and Ala, again, we have a great conversation about it. So stick around, even if you're not interested in machine intelligence and this idea of building a better artificial intelligence marketplace, these core concepts of building a decentralized organization on the blockchain are really interesting and really vital to why people are excited about all this stuff. So stick around. Uh, Also, there's a great article in the New York Times from March 8th. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can check it out. But the article is called Reality Intrudes on a Utopian Crypto Vision. And it gets into this whole idea of DAOs, what they're being used for, uh, you know, for, for good purposes and for scams for nefarious purposes. So check that out as well. Another thing about BitTensor, what I really like about what this group is doing is that um, they're also really interested in AI itself and what it is now and eventually might be used for and trying to find a way to keep that aligned with human interest, the greater good and the well-being of people first and foremost. Uh, So great conversation. Stick around for that. First, a couple of quick notes of housekeeping. Episode one of Metaverse is live. It's a conversation with Nenea Reeves from Trip about the mindful Metaverse. Check that out if you haven't already. Uh, Nenea is a great guest. It's a great conversation. I'm thrilled that that turned out to be the first episode. So take a listen, watch on YouTube if you like. It's good stuff. Also, I mentioned YouTube. You can get the podcast audio only wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever else. So subscribe, share it with your friends. If you like it, leave a review. Um, Also, the podcast is available in video format on YouTube. So check that out. And then also, there's a Substack, metaaverse.substack.com. Uh, there's a newsletter, blog blog post, newsletter kind of thing. We're going to be posting once a week for now, so you can get a little more in-depth. Uh, if you prefer to read, then listen, or if you want to do both and just get a little more depth and a whole bunch of links to go learn more on your own, sign up for the Substack. Again, episode uh, the first post, rather, is up, second post coming this week. Right now, we're aiming for a Tuesday podcast, Wednesday newsletter update schedule, uh, yeah, so, you know, that that may get refined as we go, but that's what we're on right now. Podcasts on Tuesdays, newsletter updates on Wednesdays. Uh, so Substack will get you all of that or just subscribe to the podcast wherever you like. And we're on social media, of course, who's not uh, on Twitter and on Instagram right now at Metaverse Pod, all one word. And finally, if you want to leave a comment, if you have a question, a suggestion, just want to say hi, you can do so on the socials, or if you're old school and you like email, you can email us, metaaversepod at gmail.com. Meta, M-E-T-A, averse, A-V-E-R-S-E, pod, P-O-D, at gmail.com. All right, I think that's it. 
Let's get to it. Jake and Ala from BitTensor. Enjoy the episode. All right, today we are talking to the guys from BitTensor. I'm here with Jacob Steves, Jake, and Ala Shabana, the co-founders of BitTensor. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So, uh, all right, who wants to go first and uh, tell us, there's a lot to get into, obviously, and we were, we were talking before I hit record about how the different areas of all of this stuff, Metaverse, Web3, Blockchain, everything that you know we're trying to explore in the show and how the work you're doing kind of fits all of the buckets and then some. Uh, so why don't we start by just giving us an overview of what BitTensor is and what you guys are working on. Sure, no problem. Um, yeah, so we, we hit a lot of buckets, right? So AI and blockchain, how does that make any sense, right? <clears throat> um, the idea the ideas um, for BitTensor came, came around in 2015 um, by just noticing the computational scale of the, the, the Bitcoin network, right? It's the largest supercomputer in the world. It's like 500 times larger than all of Google's data centers combined, right? You know, hashing out and, and many times larger than that now. Right. You know, you, and, you, and for the, the uninitiated, I know there'll be at least a few folks listening who are like, wait, wait, what is all this? There's one, there's a bigger computer. This is spread yeah. out. These are nodes spread out. Yeah, they're spread out. They're working on a common problem, though, right? You could right. say that, that it's a supercomputer working on hashing the next block of the Bitcoin blockchain. Right. And, you know, it raises this question, like, like why and, and how? <laughs> you know, those, how are, those are the two big questions. <laughs> yeah, like. How 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 does this this massive network you know uh, come come to come into be when there's nobody running it really is decentralized and about and you know we we think the the fundamental reason is that um, Bitcoin al- along with inventing this digital trust um, with digital currencies uh, al- allowed for the first creation of these digital markets right where you can build like this commodity market global commodity market for the creation of of hashes, and that's that stimulated the advancements in in chips, ASIC chips for for hashing um, the Bitcoin blockchain next, next hashes, um, and and also stimulated this hive mind, this global hive mind of engineers that are putting on their desktop computers, and and obviously it's evolved to be really sophisticated. Now you have these massive uh, data centers in China and Kazakhstan and, and across the United States where you have rows upon rows and rows upon rows of ant miners, you know, hashing out. And at the time, um, you know, both me and Ala were were machine learning engineers, and AI is also f- fundamentally a computational problem. You know, it's the intersection between algorithm, compute, and data, right. uh, and it's building this this thing. This you know, this you could call it a commodity uh, in digital intelligence. And and so we were like, well, why don't we apply the this new technique, this new invention of digital trust and digital currencies? Um, to create this this commodity, which is incredibly valuable, right? It's 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 valued in the in the billions of dollars by companies like like Google and OpenAI, um, and so we you know around that time we started working on you know building a mechanism. What does that mechanism look like? How could we possibly measure machine intelligence, um, and and then get computers from all across the globe to 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 build it and 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 contribute it to this this network. And so that's what BitTensor is. Basically, it's, it's just a protocol for measuring and incentivizing the production of machine intelligence. Uh, it's, it, we, decentralization is part of it, right? So AI is part of it. Um, blockchain is part of it. <clears throat> but you, you would say that we're not, we're not trying to create the same killer app as, as, as Bitcoin. Bitcoin wants to be decentralized because they want to be censorship resistant. Um, we're taking advantage of decentralization because we have engineers around the, on the world and connecting them together. Um, we're taking advantage of decentralization also potentially because w- we want to uh, approach this alignment problem in AI. You may have heard this, right? How can we yeah. align the development of artificial intelligence with humanity? And we think decentralization, which is about power and control, is also an answer to that. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's a really high level you know, explanation of where BitTensor is and like what we're about. Right. So there's a lot in there to unpack that um, I think is important. I, w- I was going to say... I don't want to put you on the spot and ask you to explain the blockchain, except I think I'm going to wind up doing that with every guest, at least for the couple first, you know, however long of the show. So sure. a couple, couple of things in here. You guys are bit tensor. I'm saying guys, because you're two guys, but I don't mean to be uh, gender specific. <laughs> 
BitTensor is building out a network. Yeah. Is that fair? Is that a fair? Okay. And, and the idea is to bring people together, bring folks together who are working on an artificial intelligence. So machine learning engineers, let's say there are other job titles too, from across the globe, working on their own, you know, computers, workstations, wherever they are, right? To share intelligence, to share sort of the output of their own work, to maybe work collaboratively on larger problems, that kind of thing? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I guess before getting into some of the stuff like, wait, ha- what's hashing and decentralization, all that, maybe just to keep it in the realm of software engineering and that kind of thing, how does this differ from open source? How does it differ from other ways that people have been and are collaborating, you know, right. working remotely, whatever it is? Right. I, I think so. I uh, Sorry, go, go ahead, Alan. No, I'm just going to basically, um, um, I want to say, bring it back down to a lower level. Um, essentially, as it stands today, as Jake was essentially saying, is that um, the field of AI is problematic, right? So first of all, AI production itself is inefficient. There's thousands of engineering terms worldwide. There's all kinds of websites like Kaggle and so on that really enable you to create these models and kind of try to either monetize them in some way or have them kind of published and have people use them. But what you're really doing is you're just building on the existing research, but your actual model that you're building is actually probably learning stuff that other models have already learned. So there's a bit of an inefficiency there, right? Kind of retraining all over again every single time. And this is because we don't have the ability to measure intelligence as a commodity today. Can I uh, Um, I ask you real quick, just to break down that process of training a model, feeding it with data, that kind of thing. Can you maybe on a very high level, just kind of explain for folks not in the field sort of what, what that what that entails? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think on the most basic level, uh, you essentially have three working groups um, when you're training a model. You have your data set, which could be anything. So let's right. say for the sake of example, you are trying to train a model that learns what buses look like on pictures. Um, and you, then you have your you, model. You read my mind. I was like, captures, captures. <laughs> <laughs> captures, yeah. yeah. So uh, then you have your model, which is essentially just a, uh, it's effectively a, uh, a computer program that will optimize its own internal um, coefficients to understand um, what information is coming out of the, the data set that will help it identify what a bus looks like, for example, right. like it has right. wheels and so on. Right. And finally, you have your loss function, right? All of the loss function is, it sounds like a scary term, but what it really is, is it's just an indicator for the model of what kind of mistakes it made. Right. Okay. How how incorrect was it by the time that it learned whatever a bus should look like? Right. And that's essentially really the most basic form of machine learning. Um, you just have your data, it could be labeled or unlabeled. And if it is labeled, then you want to basically just check how close you are to the right ground truth of the so data then learning. If I'm working by myself and I have trained a model and I'm happy with how well it's able to identify bus versus not bus. Yeah. How would somebody like say yourself use my my work? Right. So so let's say for example, I'm trying to train a model that is working on something similar. Let's say I'm trying to identify what cars look like, right. not buses. Right. So uh, one of the most infamous problems of uh, of uh, machine learning is something called catastrophic forgetting. Right. Where for example, if you flip a single pixel on an image, it's going to think it's a giraffe, not even right. a bus anymore. Right. Right. So uh, one of the things that you that for example, I could do, if I'm training this model to learn what cars look like, is I can maybe speak to yours and say, hey, I'm looking at this kind of picture. What is yours learning? What, what kind of insight can you give me from that? And what's going to happen is yours is going to give me back some information. And it's going to say, okay, maybe it's this, this, and this. And this is what I think it looks like. And right. that's kind of what I can learn from you and to kind of uh, make myself a little bit better. Yep. Now, the difference is, obviously, it's kind of maybe a little bit down the line, but some models might not be compatible, right? Maybe what information you give me is going to make my model a little bit dumber, maybe not smarter. <laughs> Right. So in this case, what I would do is maybe I would look for someone else to speak to and learn sure. from them. And sure. that's where kind of the concept of the network that Jake was describing comes in. Yep. Perfect. That was great. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, but that was good, good ground setting. So. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So like, if you look at a lot of these other projects that are, they're sharing models, like hugging face is a really good example, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're sharing the, you're sharing the weights of a trained model. Um, but you're not actually uh, sh- sharing the the knowledge itself. So when you check out a hugging face model, you look at its performance on a data set. You say, okay, how well did it do on glue, for instance, which is a, a benchmark, like it's a test that you can put your models through, right? right. Um, 
and and so we're 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 measuring and searching searching the the space of machine knowledge um, using human defined explanations of its intelligence, right? Um, but but the beauty of digital currencies and using computers to measure something like a commodity is that is that it's high resolution, so we can actually measure how valuable this model, the information that this model is producing um, using entropic methods like Fisher's information, which is like a, a measure of inf- the informational significance of the right. model to, right. Right. to another. And, right. and before we couldn't do that, we couldn't, we couldn't really measure the, the performance, uh, sort of the value of one computer to another because we didn't have the technology to do that, right? Bitcoin, that was the invention of Bitcoin, right? Digital trust, the ability, the ability for computers to, to have a conception of trust and value that they can transfer between each other. And so how is BitTensor um, taking advantage of that? So we, we built um, you know, this, this network where it's a valid, it's like Bitcoin. I mean, so your, your, your listeners might not know too much about the way that Bitcoin works, but essentially Bitcoin is a set of computers that are validating the, the work done by the other computers in the system. Proof mm-hmm. of work, you've heard that before, right? right? right. So, yeah. so we, uh, you know, um, BitTensor is a proof of work network also where the, the computers are validating whether or not the other computers in the system are producing information that is valuable it's to valuable. the collective. Okay, right, right. So does, they're, hey, they're producing some, some numbers. That, that we call them tensors, the things that are being passed between the computers. Tensors being the root word of languages like TensorFlow, for instance, which you may have heard of that language. Yep. Having done many podcasts on NVIDIA. <laughs> right. um, so, uh so they're passing tensors and these validators are validating whether or not that information is valuable. And right. so, you know, fundamentally that's, that's all that, that, that the tensor is. It's a, it's a, it's a mechanism for computers to, to uh, reach consensus about which computers are producing information uh, that's valuable and then paying them out uh, accordingly. Got it. And so um, to ask a very sort of uh, <laughs> genuine, but also naive sounding question, what is happening in the network that, couldn't be done? Is it just a matter of the network can do it so much faster than humans could validate? Or is there, you know, something happening that um, you were talking to, let me rephrase that, or is there something happening that's just beyond the sphere of what even that most highly trained human could do? Well, I think so, because, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, right, this, this amazing quality of the Bitcoin network that you have people across the globe, you know, fighting tooth and nail to build computers that are faster right. uh, and, 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 you know, finding energy sources, which are, which are free and available uh, to, to mine this cryptocurrency. Right. And, you know, so we have this, this exact same like competitive system right. where, Hey, like I'm an engineer in India and I, and I couldn't get into Google because I didn't go to the right school, but I'm actually really, really, really good machine learning engineer. And so I can come into uh, BitTensor and I can find, oh, there's some cute computing in my dad's laptop, well, but whatever. And I can build a special neural network that adds just this niche thing to this global market, right? And so we're really, we're leveraging the power of of markets to to, uh, make the system of machine intelligence, of artificial intelligence, you know, much, much more efficient. Right? And I don't think there's any company in the world that, that it can, can claim to be not just their own compute, but the stitching together of everybody else's compute at the same right, time. Right. That's going to let us to scale. Just to add to what Jake is saying as well, um, uh, as he kind of mentioned the word market, right? So a lot of these um, other applications that have kind of tried to do something similar, what's happened is there's always a human bias in there, right? Even in academic research, there's human bias. We're more likely to pick you know, research done by the most famous researcher as opposed to something done by someone maybe from a different corner of the world that might not be as famous, but still just as valid, right? Sure. So what we've done with BitTensor is effectively it's a few lines of code that'll enable whatever model that you have currently even, doesn't even have to be a new model, to learn for itself and to choose for itself whom to reward and whom to learn from. So we're removing this aspect of human bias and we're actually letting the models themselves choose who's your is, business. Is there... Does the hu- there, there must be some human bias initially with the the design of the design of the network or the design of the the model at first. Does that get filtered out over time to the point where, for right. all intents and purposes, the models really are choosing the best other models? The the design of the network itself is really defined by the problems they're trying to solve. Okay. Right? Um, so if if you're trying to solve a very specific problem, you're going to have a very specific architecture to it. So that's kind of the only bias you're going to have is towards the problem you're solving, but right. not towards other models. 
And then over time, really, it's going to be, as you said, um, it's not really going to be that relevant anymore. It, it sounds uh, to me, and, and if I'm way off, tell me, but it sounds to me almost like the um, the Silicon Valley ideal of meritocracy, uh, just, you know, hard-coded and, and writ large and unleashed on the whole internet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I mean, we're, and we're, you know, we're in this kind of uh, long tradition in artificial intelligence. I think you can situate us inside, which is, you know, um, as the clock makers of this, these incredible complex systems, we are backing away from how much control we put into them. So I'll give you an example, like in, in the early days of, of uh, machine intelligence, they tried to actually like encode um, a specific quality into the visual language model, right? Okay. It detect edges and then detect cylinders. Right. right. Um, but you know, as, as the field has progressed, you know, the, the, the methods that have been the most successful were the ones that have just stepped back right. and let computational um, adaptive system find the solution. And so we're kind of going, Hey, let's, let's step back. And, and instead of defining these, these problems really explicit, let's build markets, which are like meta systems right. and let let the network evolve itself towards the solution um you know through that adaptive adaptive ability right so let's talk about the the market the word market what's the incentive how does it actually work if i'm you know if if we finish talking and i hop on my uh yep. my imaginary machine with my imaginary models that i'm right. not smart enough to build right i put them into bit i join bittensor I help work on a problem. I'm identified as providing some valuable intelligence. Then what happens? So the question is like, how, how do we de- determine if it's valuable? Or how or, am I rewarded? How are you rewarded? Yeah. How does how the market rewarded? aspect of it work? Yeah. Right. Exactly. So um, it's, we have a form of consensus. So we have a set of validators on, on the network. It's proof of stake, essentially. Um, if to, to your listeners, proof of stake just means your weight in validating others, like how many votes you have, is a function of how many tokens you have attached to your computer. Okay, and and I and I not to derail you, but I get tokens by doing fine. good work. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that's okay. what I'm just going to go to. So they, okay, sorry, so they yeah. it's okay. So they they validate the knowledge that your computer is producing. Um. So Alan mentioned this thing called catastrophic forgetting, which is yeah. this issue where your neural network, you know, trained on one problem. When you try to train on another problem, you forget the okay. previous one. Right. And the solution to that is actually to look at the weights of your neural network and go, hey, this one's super important for this previous problem. Let's let's saturate it. And this, so there's this way, a statistical technique really, um, of determining whether or not a particular component of a neural network, these massive multi hyperparameter functions that we train in neural networks uh, in machine intelligence how valuable that thing is right and and so these neuro, these validators are doing the exact same thing they're going hey how valuable is this parameter in our in this case it's a computer producing tensors right and and goes okay well it's worth 5 you know not 5 but it's all normalized and statistical yeah, yeah. you yep. know say 5 out of 10 yep. and 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 then we we tally that up and that becomes uh you know a scoring a global scoring which then which then uh, you know advises the the new and the inflation of the digital currency. So it's very similar to say Bitcoin, where the incentive is based on inflation. Okay, and so BitTensor has its own token. That's right, BitTensor Tau. Tau, right? Okay. And what is um at, for you guys are rolling with me, so I'll just ask them in sort of plain speak. What is Tau worth? Let's say I get five Tau. What yeah. can I do with five Tau? Tau, do you want to answer that? So yeah, we're kind of delving into legal territory here. Um, we actually can't <laughs> the actual. Uh, <laughs> if you want to read a safe harbor statement, you know, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can't delve into those specifics, but um, effectively, the only thing we can tell you is that the Tau itself um, is not being sold on exchange or anything like that right now. It's not. It was. We kind of adopted a fair market launch, so there is no ICO, no pre mine. Um, every Tau in existence today has been fairly mined and has actually contributed to the knowledge of neural networks in the past. But but Al, I might I might mention that that so the real value of Tau is based on the value of the network that we're creating, right? Correct. And, yes. and so because Tau is the is the key that that you use to get access to the system, and and so it's like a utility token, right? Right. It's it's not yeah. it's it killer app is the is the the intelligence that's produced by the network. It's you know unlike 
again to use yeah. Bitcoin as an example. Yeah, no, sure. So kind of went have- to full legal mode there. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's also needed. Well, on a, you know, on a on a sort of very abstract level, um, this notion of um, uh, decentralized everything, right? And this notion of um, rebuilding, you know, that as I'm learning more about, about all of this stuff, which is really just, a, I'm just scratching the surface, but this notion of decentralized currency and this notion of, um, you know, sort of democratizing access to different things. And, and in this case, I'm a, I'm a highly skilled machine learning engineer who knows how to do stuff, but for whatever reasons, mm-hmm. doesn't have a job that either, you know, allows me access to work on certain kinds of problems or to work with certain kinds of colleagues or to mm-hmm. get compensated at, you know, the market rate of a Google engineer in, in Silicon mm-hmm. Valley for that matter. Right. Um, I guess I'm kind of wondering that the idea of, you know, we're, we're, we, you are, are making, um, making it easier for folks to contribute to and collaborate on this intelligence that could theoretically, you know, benefit the whole world, right? Um, the flip side is sort of, I still have to eat and food costs money. So mm-hmm. is that, and, and it might be a thing that over time I learned to decouple in my head, right? But I'm thinking of, you know, I've earned a token. The token gives mm-hmm. me more weight in the community. That's worth something. I get it. But sort of from a, um, at the other end, like if my contributions to machine intelligence are ultimately going to be used by some company who's making a ton of money, yep. how does that happen? Or, or not right. how does that happen, but sort of like, what's yeah, in like, it for me, right? <laughs> right. So, so you, you, got, you got the Tau by contributing intelligence. Right? Yes. They need the Tau to access it. Got it. So okay. They're okay. your customer. Got it. Okay. So then, I mean, can I sell them the Tau? Can I trade them the Tau for, I don't know, Dogecoin or, you know, whatever that I could potentially convert into food? That is that is the eventual idea. Yeah. yeah. Is that you'll okay. be able to kind cool. of sell yeah. in your Tau after you've earned it. And I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to get at your secret sauce, secret sauce or, you know, hold any feet to the fire. I'm just trying to understand on a sort of more global level. I, we, you know, we, I had a conversation yesterday with, um, well, somebody working in the uh, VR XR space, but we got to talking about tokens, and um, uh, I lost my train of thought. I apologize. Um, and talking about right, talking about the idea with NFTs, for instance, that you know a a musician could record something, and or an artist is a better example, right? And the whole idea of you know the reselling of art is a huge global marketplace. Mm. Under fiat currency systems, the original artist doesn't necessarily see a cut of sales when the third owner sells to the fourth owner. One of the things about NFTs is the idea of changing that by baking that, you know, royalty, so to speak, baking it in. So Mm. is there a similar function if we're looking at the use of tokens to make markets in, you know? Yeah. I mean, so in... In modern in modern AI discourse, a lot of the conversation has been around access, you know, open access, right. open AI. Right, right, right. right. Um, but but we think that the 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 bigger issue is is ownership, AI ownership, who who actually controls the AI, who who gets to say what it's trained on, that kind of right. thing. Right. And um, with the way that we've tokenized BitTensor. As an engineer, you, you by holding Tau, you also own this, the network, right? So that's ownership of the system, not just the ability to access it, which is also very important, right? It's right. also an open network, right. but 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 the ability to, to access it and own it, own it. So, but if you did sell your Tau, all of it, then yeah, you'd lose your you you lose your your right. tokenized ownership, and maybe we could build something in it where the you you get some sort of echo of your previous ownership, but that sure. would be essentially like just selling a few tokens less. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, what led you to to go after make this your mission and go after building building this building it this way? Yeah, I mean, we, we I mean, we both have our own approach to this. I'll let Al tell tell his story, um, but we we met up, so we 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 both have our own yeah. reasons. Yeah, let's get let's get the origin story. Yeah, um, yeah, sounds good. Actually, it's great. Yeah, so 
Both Jake and I kind of are ex Silicon Valley folks. Um, I worked at VMware for quite a bit. Uh, Jacob worked at Google for quite a bit. Um, at least I'll tell on my side. Uh, I worked on decentralized AI for quite a while, um, especially in VMware systems, where it's basically hyper converged infrastructure. We have many computers kind of trying to um, speak to each other and kind of learn from each other in a certain sense. Um, uh, ended up kind of working a little bit of research and development on that. And um, in that time, I kind of um, arrived at a similar conclusion to Jacob. Um, that was before we met. And uh, we ended up with, uh, actually, sort of after we met, we ended up with a similar kind of outlook on AI, which is basically the three problems that we described. Um, inefficiency, right. centralized ownership, and um, effectively the uh, just the idea that general intelligence is not really attainable by a single person. Um, we ended up meeting in a uh, in a research collaboration that was kind of online. Um, it was called 4AI. And um, I had presented something that was akin to what BitTensor was doing. Oh, and cool. Jacob kind of ended up reaching out and saying, yeah. hey, I'm like three years ahead of you doing this. You should just join <laughs> me and we'll work on this. Right. So we kind of ended up working together since. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's really, really well said, Alex. You know, um, uh, we... You know, I, I, I forget the concept, but it's like this idea that that ideas are in the newosphere and you just kind of like pick them up. So like there's people that have them at the same time. Right. Right. And uh, and so that was that was very much what would happen with me and Ala. So like but I, I kind of have a, my story was before I was at Google, I was uh, working for DARPA um, oh, building yeah. what are called neuromorphic chips. You probably okay. heard that term. super cool company. Um, was that? I, I've heard it and I nod along to it and I'm not really hundred percent sure what it means. <laughs> yeah. Basically the idea, I mean, you could have a podcast just on this yeah, concept. Right. I'm it's sure. Really, really cool. But neuromorphic yeah. basically just means like, like the brain, you right. know? Right. Um, so chips that are like the brain. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working for this, this company that was, was building uh, synapses like out of these things called memristors, which were like resistors, but you could change the resistance. Okay. Right. Really really cool idea. And yeah, so yeah. they're like, apps, so you could put them on a chip, you could build the brain, a brain's a bunch of synapses and you could train it a billion, right. billion times faster than NVIDIA can. Worth an episode of your, your podcast. Definitely. Um, but the problem, <laughs> the, the problem with, with this, uh, you know, and I was working for this absolute genius. His name was Alex Nugent, absolute genius. And, but what the problem was kind of like, there's no direct market for me to plug this super fast chip into. Right. Right. I'm this genius. I got this great idea, but I have to go and work for IBM. I have to go work for right. NVIDIA right. for my idea to actually, you know, gain from its, you know, uh, ability to, to, to beat this market. Right. And, and so that was, you know, that's one of the explanations of how I, how I came to BitTensor was like, look, thinking of that, what if my boss could plug his awesome, you know, super genius, uh, chip into a market that actually could reward and incentivize the production of these things. Right. Um, you know, he'd be able to build his company a lot faster. Uh, and so how is, um, how's BitSensor structured as a, well, I guess it's a project that is uh, under the umbrella of OpenTensor. Is that right? Yeah. So the OpenTensor Foundation maintains the project. Uh, BitSensor itself is fully open source, uh, blockchain and AI. And mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we kind of have a, Discord community that's you know full access and um, there's I believe correct me if I'm wrong Jake we have about ten developers at this point including you and me and they were pretty, uh, pretty small very small yeah very scrappy team and um, yeah we've been at the, we launched the network out in November last year November third and we've been attending it since right we're taping beginning of March so about four months um, and how many um, is it miners the right term how many participants folks on the network uh, yeah. we have a Oh, go for it, Jake. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say miners. Yeah, exactly. So we yeah. we 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 measure we measure the number of active computers, which is like the computers that are responding. Okay. Um, and that's uh, just over what was it, fifteen hundred dollar? Yeah, we just passed nice. fifteen hundred last week. Nice, so. congrats. Um, and so I have I have to ask. Um, you mentioned you know a little bit about the difference between a proof of stake network and a proof of uh, mm -hmm. uh, proof of work. Um, a lot's been made about the environmental impact of these, you know, giant crypto mining data yeah. centers, if you will, crypto farms, mining farms, all the electricity yeah. is being used, where the electricity comes from. Obviously, there's <laughs> too many things wrong with the world to list right now. 
But, uh, you know, global warming, climate change, all of that is, is near the top of the list. Right. What's your, I guess, first of all, what the, the BitTensor, do I call it the BitTensor blockchain? What's the right way to, to speak? Sure. Right? You could call it the BitTensor blockchain, right? Okay. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so what's the environmental impact right now, right. so far as you know? And then what's kind of your take, you know, both in terms of what your company's do or your project's doing, but more globally about, you know, UW. Yeah. Blockchain becoming green enough that it's uh yeah. Yeah, you get where I'm going. Yeah, no, I, I get it. And the the argument against the proof of work blockchains, you know, I think it a lot of the time it stems from a misunderstanding of the fact that the POW is actually doing something productive. Oh, it's just doing something stupid, it's just burning right. The it, it, there's all these computers trying to solve the same math problem, nobody needs the answer to. And yeah, no one needs the answer yeah, to, so what's yeah. the value? And then right. and so you could you know, and I think that obviously the value is is the fact that it secures the Bitcoin network. But but if you don't value Bitcoin, then then it doesn't right. seem very right. valuable, right? <laughs> right. 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 We, we but we're in a luckier position because we're actually producing something that people automatically understand the value of that thing. You're producing artificial intelligence. That's it's a commodity. It's valuable. It's right. people want it, right? Um, so it's very easy for us to go. Well, look, no, actually, this is this is something that people want. It's not wasted. Compute cycles. Yeah, I mean, on top of it, the the artificial intelligence system is very inefficient. You know, as Al, as Al was mentioning yeah. at the beginning of the call, like there's a lot of repeat work going on. You know, the next big best model in the world, GPT N, uh, <laughs> had to relearn everything that GPT three learned. Right, right. And so, if we can move into a world where machine intelligence, there's protocols for sharing machine intelligence that are really sophisticated. And the corpus of global AI uh, is something that people can build off in the same way that a human doesn't just learn everything. You know, and I don't have to right, reinvent right. mathematics every time I I come, you know, I'm born, right? So um, the, there's if we think that we're actually solving efficiencies in the traditional sense of, of AI, so we're making it more green. But, you know, to be honest, uh, we, we can't make that, that claim, you know, all we can, all we can say is point to it and go, look, let's, let's try to fix this aspect. Right. Um, real quick proof of stake versus proof of work, um, in, in 30 seconds. Uh, sure. In, in proof of work, um, you're, you're measuring votes, uh, in a consensus mechanism. So you're reaching consensus about who thinks of what, and so you need to vote. Uh, in a proof of work, you're voting based on computational power. Usually, uh, a, pr- a, pr- a proof of work algorithm like SHA-256, which is just producing hashes, and in a proof of stake algorithm, the number of votes is based on a tokenization of those votes. So, you know, the number of tokens you have, uh, and so that ties the the finite element to tokens rather than than proof of work, which is computation. And they yeah. have their ups and downs. They have their their various pros and cons. Sure. Um, so uh, as I'm thinking about the the closing minutes of our conversation here, I've got kind of two threads, but also want to open it up to stuff that you guys might want to talk about that we haven't hit upon yet. So how do you want to do this? Are there are there things on your uh, your your cliff notes, so to speak, that you wanted to hit? Things you want that BitTensor is doing that you want to talk about? And if you want to back burner that, I'll hit you with one of my one of my two questions. Alan, what do you think? Um, that's a very good question. So the one thing that we wanted to kind of um, maybe emphasize a little bit, I'm not sure if that's um, yeah. really worth thinking into, is that um, everybody at the project, including myself and Jacob, are all AI engineers. So our main kind of focus has been mostly on the AI bits to kind of make sure that everything's validated properly, everything is working properly. And one of the milestones that we... Um, are trying to hit is eventually to beat the size of GPT-3. So at the moment now we've reached, uh, Jake, I believe it was 225 billion parameters. That's a low which, estimate. Yeah. So for and, context, and again, for oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you mid thought, but for folks yeah. who don't know what GPT-3 is, we've, we've thrown it on a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So GPT-3 is kind of uh, OpenAI's flagship uh, language model at this point. So it's kind of state of the art. It's the latest and greatest, and that's what we're using. Um, and so GPT-3's uh, Parameter count is, I think, is 175 billion. So we're kind of approaching that number rapidly. And cool. um, the next thing they want to do at Potential eventually is kind of beat that benchmark and kind of right, beat that right, CDR. Right. right. Cool. And so that's kind of what's most of our efforts have been at. And that's what they're going to continue to be at this year. 
And so along those lines, and this is one of my two questions, um, is is BitTensor the 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 project? Are you growing in terms of staff numbers, or is the focus on you know we've got what we need, and really the power is in the network, and it's all about you know recruiting more folks to come on and, and take ownership and contribute. We are doing both actually. So okay, we are cool. growing in terms of staff numbers. We are um, actually actively hiring. Um, You're hiring. You can looking... plug, you know, plug the job openings. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Please, by all means, reach out. Um, we are wrapping up our series A as well. And uh, we're looking to kind of uh, expand the team out quite a bit, maybe 30 nice. people by the end of the year. Yes. And, um, you know, hiring all kinds of folks. Cool. Okay. So here's the, uh, here's what we'll land on. The singularity, sentient AI, you know, where, where is this? Are, are we headed toward, is this inevitable or the computer? You know, I ask all the cliche questions, but you guys are in this and yeah. you're in this also in a way that, um, I mean, I think anybody working in AI and machine learning is thinking about the future. It goes without saying, but there's something yeah. about your approach that's maybe even a step, you know, sort of beyond, um, there's the race for the raw horsepower, to put it in probably not the right terms. But then there's also the thoughts about, well, how are we doing it? And how as a, you know, there's a community building aspect that um, is probably similar to, to corporations or companies in some ways, but obviously quite different. Um, I, either where do you see this headed? Or maybe a better question is kind of, you know, what, what's, your, what's your goal or what's your kind of utopian end state for... Uh, you know, machine learning and AI and how it relates right. to human beings. Right. Um, so can I lay the foundation down, Jake? And then you can kind yeah. of take off of it. Yeah, sure. So this actually tackles the third problem of our thesis, uh, which is effectively that intelligence itself is not generalized. So the holy grail for you know any machine learning engineer is artificial general intelligence, right. AGI. Right. Generally true. Um, yeah. yeah. So the idea behind it is that what we you know, what I think everyone is really kind of touching on lately uh, is that it's not really attainable by a single team or a single company. There's just no way. It requires way too much manpower, ingenuity, compute, and time to actually reach. So, you know, you've got companies like Facebook that are, sorry, Meta, that are uh, coming up with, you know, mm. 16,000 GPU powered supercomputers trying to achieve this, but really they're still dwarfed by things like the, the, super, the computing power of Bitcoin. So the only team that we can really, the only way that we can actually come close to achieving something like AGI or something resembling AGI is through all of us working together combined, right? Um, man didn't get on the moon through the combination of, you know, a small team or like a small company. It was a combination of countless scientists and engineers. Working it together. wasn't one guy in a cowboy hat with a rocket? Uh, it was, absolutely. It was not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's kind of uh, where... That's kind of the third thesis, the third bit of our thesis that I want to kind of touch on. And then Jake, I'll leave the rest of you. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, exactly. So we're 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 hoping to scale. We, we believe that that the problem is actually a lot bigger than people claim, you know. Uh, and you know, we're not always is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's actually this funny thing where it's like uh, uh, people have thought that AGI was 15 years away. Uh, since the 1950s, right. like they always, they always say it's 15, 15 years, years away. Yeah, yeah. It's because because you're dealing with something that's so unknown. So I guess that actually just tells you what the average, you know, unknown amount of time is for people. <laughs> right. um, uh, so so we we don't really know if we're going to be able to create that, but we certainly think that like creating these this community of machines or culture of machines, you know, mediated by a market, uh, global Bitcoin scale is how we're going to reach the the level of compute that was required, you know, and also the time scale. We're, we're training, we're training like a single network over a very long period of time, and it, that's actually unique, you know. So we're moving in uh, that dimension. But I mean, it, like the answer is we don't know what, if it's going to create AGI. But I think the the important thing is is like if we do create AGI, the question is who's going to own it? Yeah. And I think that's actually way more important than mm -hmm. you know is it going to launch the nukes. I think it's it's whether whether or not AI is going to be controlled by a small group of people, is it going to be centralized into a into the hands of those those people, and I think that the solution to to these problems is to work with tokenization to to build technologies for ownership of AI where it's aligned with humanity, right? It's it's just our token or you know for our DAO is distributed into the, into the hands of many people, uh, and there's mechanisms in place to stop that thing from from getting out of control and unaligned from humanity. And I think that's maybe the the more interesting uh, question and the much more difficult problem that we're working on. We don't have a solution. That's not our first uh, technical challenge, but yeah. something we want to draw people in. 
with uh, potentially finding a solution to. Excellent. I think that's a that's the alignment the alignment of problems, so to speak, is a is a great place to land here. Um, guys, for people listening or watching, we're we're uh, video on YouTube, audio wherever you get your podcasts. There's my little plug uh, for folks who want to find out more about BitTensor, about OpenTensor. Uh, I know there's you know a white paper, a blog, job listings. Uh, give us some URLs. You know, say them out loud. We'll put them in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. So you can uh, find us at bittensor.com. That's uh, kind of the most straightforward way. There's uh, our blog, our network visualizer, and everything is there. We also have a Discord channel, um, and we also have, a, I think it was a ghost blog uh, blog setting. So um, yeah, honestly, you'll find all that information on the bittensor.com website. Please feel free to jump on there. And um, we also have a LinkedIn website as well. Excellent. Well, Ala, Jake, thank you guys so much for uh, taking the leap of faith to be one of the first guests on the show. <laughs> uh, but more importantly, for the conversation, there's a lot in there for folks to unpack. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe we can do it again, whether whether here or on the other channel and, and uh, dig in a little bit more uh, to the stuff you guys are doing. We'd love to. Thanks, Noah. All right. That'll do it for this episode of Metaverse. Again, thanks to Jake and Ala from BitTensor for a great conversation. Special thanks to Jacqueline from BitTensor for making the conversation possible. You can check them out on bittensor.com. Uh, we've got a lot in the works for you. There, there's so much to explore in the metaverse. We're just getting started. Did I say metaverse? In the metaverse on the Metaverse podcast. We're just getting started. We've got episodes lined up covering everything, covering uh, fashion and sneakers, covering cybersecurity and fraud, how to stay safe, in the metaverse, covering the science behind emotions. How do you detect and process and deal with emotions when you're an avatar in the metaverse? There's so much to explore. I'm excited about it. Thanks for coming on the journey. Make sure to subscribe, leave a rating if you're so inclined, uh, and hit us up. Say hi on the socials or via email, metaversepod at gmail.com. You can let us know what you think. You can suggest a topic or a guest, or you can just say hello. Whatever the case, we appreciate you. Thanks for listening. Again, my name is Noah Kravitz, and we'll see you next time on Metaverse.